Good morning, everyone. And welcome to worship on our first Sunday of the Methodist New Year. And today it is our covenant service. As we gather for worship this morning, I read you from Psalm 103, these words. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. He redeems you from the life of the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. As we gather today, one of the things we do in the covenant is to remind ourselves about God's faithfulness to us and then how we respond to that faithfulness in our own prayer of commitment. So we're going to stand and worship. Oh Jesus, I have promised. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we acknowledge that you alone are the one who deserves our praise and the glory. We thank you that as we gather here on the first day of the new Methodist year, we can gather as a people who can declare you have been faithful to us. And that faithfulness has not depended on how faithful we've been to us. You have been reliable. You have been trustworthy. And Lord, we marvel at your graciousness to us. You call us to follow you. And even when we fail, even when we get it wrong, you still call us to come follow you, 
to start again. So Lord, may this time of worship be a time where we refocus on you, where we remember what you have done for us, when we look to you, not just for today, but for every day, and where we revel in the love and compassion you have for us. Thank you that you are saviour, friend and redeemer. We offer you our praise and thanks and include, conclude with saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to have our time of family news now. Has anyone got some news to share? We've had a lot of this week. Oh, congratulations. How many years? <laughs> exactly. Less for murder. Okay. I'm glad you're celebrating in joy. Well, congratulations. Oh, great. Oh, yes. Well, it's great news. We need to think about and pray about all the young people who will be leaving home in the next few weeks to, to maybe go away to study for the first time. Pray for the universities and also for the, the churches where a lot of students live. We have churches in our circuit where lots of students live. Um, but churches up and down the country who are doing their best to welcome to, uh, students into the cities and towns where they are and uh, to reach out in love. So as we, as we pray for your grand, grandson, we will remember that too. Think about Messy Church. Okay, uh, it's not this week, it's the week after. Uh, and you're doing Harvest. Excellent. And something new to come, coffee morning. Oh, and is that starting? Watch this, watch this space. The Saturday coffee morning will be returning, so watch this space. Okay, so the Disasters Emergency Committee are collecting. You will have heard about the floods in Pakistan. Uh, many of you may have given already, but there is an opportunity if you want to give uh, today. You'll be able to give today over there. And uh, as well as remembering the people of Ukraine, uh, we're also thinking widely about other places where uh, there is conflict um, and particularly at the moment we, we want, need to remember uh, the folk in Pakistan. Um, it, it's mind-blowing that uh, an area the size of our whole country is underwater. Uh, it is devastating. Does anyone have any other news to share? Great. Okay, uh, we have our readings now. Uh, Deuteronomy. Today, everyone in our nation is standing here in the Lord's presence, including leaders and officials, parents and children, and even those foreigners who cut wood and carry water for us. We are at this place of worship to promise that we will keep our part of the agreement with the Lord our God. In this agreement, the Lord promised that you would be his people and that he would be your God. He first made this promise to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And today, the Lord is making the same promise to you. But it isn't just for you. It is also for your descendants. Oh. Next reading is from Jeremiah. The Lord said, 
The time will surely come when I will make a new agreement with the people of Israel and Judah. It will be different from the agreement I made with their ancestors when I led them out of Egypt. Although I was their God, they broke that agreement. Here is the new agreement that I, the Lord, will make with the people of Israel. I will write my laws on their hearts and minds. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they have to teach one another to obey me. I, the Lord, promise that all of them will obey me, ordinary people and rulers alike. I will forgive their sins and forget the evil things they have done. Amen. The next reading is from Romans. Dear friends, God is good, so I beg you to offer your bodies to him as a living sacrifice, pure and pleasing. That's the most sensible way to serve God. Don't be like the people of this world, but let God change the way you think. Then you will know how to do everything that is good and pleasing to him. Amen. When I moved to the northeast from Liverpool in 1999, people said that my children sounded as though they had walked off the set of Brookside. If you don't remember Brookside, it was a 1990s soap that was set in Liverpool. Uh, no one now comments on their Scouse accent because very quickly, of course, they lost it. And my daughter has spent three years living in America and while she hasn't got an American accent, she has adopted American ways of talking. She often talks about silverware instead of cut cutlery and she never ever goes to the loo, she always goes to the bathroom. Her university was Duke, but if you ask her which university she went to, she'll say Duke, because that's how they said it in America. We are all changed by the environment that we are in. We're affected by it, we adopt it, it becomes part of who we are, and usually, we have no idea that we've adopted it because it becomes so natural. Today is a covenant service. John Wesley instituted this event uh, and service to happen once a year. It was to be a marker in the lives of the people called Methodist, a point where they reflected and stopped and thought about how they were living the Christian life. The version of the service that we have goes right back to Wesley himself, but we do it very differently. We kind of, it appears out of nowhere, we have it for a, day, a Sunday, and then it seems to go away again, and then it'll come back. And unless you know the Methodist year really well, you might not notice it. In Wesley's day, there was a whole series of services that would run up to it, explaining the prayer and the commitment and what was being asked. So that when you came to the service, you did so consciously and deliberately. I hope today you knew it was covenant service, but if you didn't, don't worry. This is the Sunday where we acknowledge that there are times where we need to reset. There are times where we just need to stop and take stock rather than just keep going and keep going and keep going. In some ways, every Sunday is a kind of mini reset. We come to church. We focus on worshipping God and we reset our lives. But the covenant service asks something of us who will take part in it. It asks us to make a commitment. And the understanding is that we live in a world, in an environment that isn't necessarily focused entirely on God. We live in a world where what's acceptable, what's seen as normal, is not what is true 
for followers of Jesus. We live to different standards. And unfortunately, sometimes we get so influenced by the place that we live and the culture that we live in, we forget to reorientate ourselves back on what we are called to as Christians. The Apostle Paul, in one of his letters, talks about us being ambassadors for Christ. Now, an ambassador is someone who lives in a foreign country and who represents that country that he's been sent from to the people there. And that image of Christians not being in Christendom, but being in a hostile environment, is perhaps more akin to where we are. The interests, expectations of the world are much more about me first and the rest of you if we can be bothered. Paul tells us that is not the way to live as Christians. The patterns of this world are not for us to adopt unconsciously and assume that they are of the kingdom of God. And that's why in the verse that, verses that Mick read, we are called to transform our minds for the Spirit of God to work in us, to transform us. Why do we need that? We need that because for if you were here for an hour on a Sunday, you have another six days, seven for the other 23 hours, where you are living in an environment that does not necessarily accept the standards of faith. Paul says we need to ask the Holy Spirit to renew our minds. The covenant commitment we will make in this service is a reset. It's an acceptance that we haven't followed God as we should. And it's a response to what God has done. The Apostle Paul, the language is slightly different from the version that you read, Mick, but in my version, the Apostle Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, I urge you, brothers and sisters. Now you will know because I've mentioned it, uh, I'm a football fan and as well as watching what's going on on the pitch, I sometimes like watching what's going on off the pitch, uh, what's going on with the coaches and the managers and if you follow football you'll know the last couple of weeks there's been an awful lot of hoo-ha about what's going on. But those people, those coaches and managers who stand in that little box at the side of the pitch uh, very few of them will just sit down and watch the game and then politely walk off. They're engaged in what's going on. They want to know and they shout at the players and they urge them on. When Rafa Benitez was manager at uh, Newcastle, it was always hilarious, I thought. He always seemed to be pointing which way they should be sh shooting the ball towards the goal of the opposition. He was always doing this, this way. And then in the second half, this way, this way. It always seemed to be what he was doing, but he was urging them on as though they'd forgotten when they got on the pitch which way they were supposed to be going. But this is what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's our coach today. And in this letter to the Romans, he's urging us on. He's encouraging us. He's telling us this is what we should do. And it's really worth doing it because if we do, we will reach our goal our goal to follow Jesus faithfully. And he urges us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. He urges us to offer everything. And if you can remember the covenant prayer, you will know there are no finger, cross your fingers behind your back. I didn't mean it's, a, it's not a prayer that says, I'll, I'll do my best, Lord, uh, and if I don't, I'm sorry. It's a prayer that says, I will give everything to follow you. I will reorientate my life 
to follow you. When I was in the States, uh, we went to a Methodist church uh, and they were, accept- they were welcoming some new members and they had new member promises. It was a United Methodist Church um, and the, the congregation also made a promise. Nothing, nothing startling, something we might be quite used to seeing. But in the promise that the congregation were asked to make, uh, that the, the new members made commitments to follow Jesus, uh, and then the, the response that was asked of the congregation had this line in it, they also committed to follow Jesus, but it had this line in it that said, I will so order my life that these promises that I'm taking, I will so order my life That's what the covenant's about. I will so order my life that these promises of commitment I make to you today, God, will be significant, important, and the first. Now, I love preaching. Uh, Maybe it's because I have a quiet audience who are almost locked in and have to stay. But I don't have time to tell you what the previous 11 chapters of Romans have said before we get to this verse that Mick read for us. But the start of the verse, the very first word, slightly different translations, but it says, therefore, therefore I urge you, therefore. And the therefore is there because in the previous 11 chapters, The Apostle Paul has laid out what the grace of God has done to seek us, to save us, to redeem us. So just before you panic that I've made this covenant commitment really high and important, which it is, we make that because there's a therefore. And the therefore is God's already reached out to us. God's already come to us in love. God has already died on the cross. God has already been raised from the dead. God has already poured out his spirit on us. All that's been done first. And because of that, we're urged to offer everything to God in response. The covenant sets those readings that we've had. Remember the Old Testament reading? which Mark read to us uh, and talked about gathering the people together. That's in Deuteronomy. That's after they've been through the desert for 40 years and they're called to make a covenant commitment to God. The people who have wandered for 40 years, who've built a golden calf, who've broken the, the covenant, who've refused and asked Moses to take them back to Egypt because it was better in slavery, Those people who time and time again refused, were stiff-necked, the scriptures tell us, to follow God. Those are the people who gather to make this commitment to God. So if you're stiff-necked and stubborn, if you've failed, if you have, maybe you haven't got a golden calf at home, but if you have things which are more important to you than God, then this is what the covenant is about. These are the people who are called to make this commitment. Not the perfect, not the holy, not the amazing people, ordinary people like you and me who fail, who make a mess. And that's underlined in the second reading we had, uh, which Susan read for us, which is the reading from Jeremiah. And it's a beautiful promise about God changing our hearts. But Jeremiah was a prophet in exile. The people had failed to follow God and God had allowed Israel to be overrun, taken away into captivity because of their lack of faithfulness. And the promise comes in the midst of their unfaithfulness. I will draw you back. So yes, we're going to make, you're going to be invited to make a huge commitment. You're going to be invited to offer everything to God, to reorientate your life on what you know to be true of the gospel. But it is in response to what God has already done for us. It is always in response. 
when we come to take bread and wine, uh, and in the Methodist Church, we ask you to get up from your seats and come down. And there's a reason for that, because that's partly uh, I, you're saying, I want to take this and receive. But you can only receive because God has already done it. It's not about what you do in receiving. It's about responding to what God has already done. The Apostle Paul writes, I urge you, brothers and sisters, therefore in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Today we're invited to offer true worship to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, come and help us. Make the commitment we need to. Give us the grace to hear you call, come follow me. Today, and every day. Amen. We're going to sing the hymn of response, I the Lord of sea and sky.
watch a very short video. It's a couple of minutes long, and it's what uh, is called a doodle prayer. And you will see somebody draw out uh, and write the words of the covenant promise that we are going to make. So you'll be able to see these words uh, and have time to think and reflect as this plays. Thank you. God made a covenant with the people of Israel, calling them to be a holy nation, chosen to bear witness to his steadfast love by finding delight in the law. The covenant was renewed in Jesus Christ our Lord in his life, work, death, and resurrection. In him all people may be set free from sin and its power and united in love and obedience. In this covenant, God promises us new life in Christ. And for our part, we promise to live no longer for ourselves, but for God. We meet, therefore, as generations have met before us to renew the covenant which bound them and binds us to God. Let us then seek forgiveness for the sin by which we have denied God's claim upon us. Let us pray. God of mercy, hear us as we confess our sins. For the sin that has made us slow to learn from Christ, reluctant to follow him, and afraid to bear the cross. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. For the sin that has caused the poverty of our worship, the formality and selfishness of our prayers, our neglect of fellowship and the means of grace, and our hesitating witness for Christ. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. For the sin that has led us to misuse your gifts, evade our responsibilities, and fail to be good stewards of your creation. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. For the sin that has made us unwilling to overcome evil with good, tolerant of injustice, quick to condemn, and selfish in sharing your love with others. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. (coughs) 
Have mercy on on me, O God, in in your your constant constant love, in the fullness of your mercy, blot out my offences, wash away all my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Give me the joy of your help again, and strengthen me with a willing spirit. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, to all who truly repent, this is his gracious word. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us again accept our place within this covenant which God has made with us and with all who are called to be Christ's disciples. This means that by the help of the Holy Spirit, we accept God's purpose for us and the call to love and serve God in all our life and work. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honour, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and material interest. Others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please uh, ourselves. In others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Yet, yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ, who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make this covenant of God our own. Let us give ourselves to him, trusting in his promises and relying on his grace. Eternal God, in your faithful and enduring love, you call us to share in your gracious covenant in Jesus Christ. In obedience, we hear and accept your commands. In love, we seek to do your perfect will. With joy, we offer ourselves anew to you. We are no longer our own, but yours. Shall we say together? I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will, put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you, or laid aside for you, exalted for you, or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I am freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Will you pray with me? We have entered this covenant not for ourselves alone, but as Christ's followers, called to serve and witness to the good news. Loving God, hear us as we pray for the church and the world. We pray for the world. 
where climate change is having devastating effects. We pray especially today for Pakistan, where one third of the country is underwater, leaving families homeless, hungry, and open to disease. We pray for generous giving and that the humanitarian assistance that is needed will reach these areas as quickly as possible. We pray for peace in Ukraine and all countries affected by war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the worldwide church and especially for the church in our own country who at this time in September are preparing to welcome new students, students who've moved away from home, maybe for the first time they've ever been away. We pray for parents too who will be looking to the church to enable these young people to know the message of hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country as we wait for the results of who will be the new conservative leader and the new prime minister. We cry out to the government. We want to see justice for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those in our community. We pray for staff and teachers and students in our schools, especially in our local schools. We think about those going to school for the first time and how that makes you feel as a parent. We pray for those who are a bit older, and especially for Lorna's grandson, as he moves away from home for the first time. We pray for those who are bereaved, those who are struggling with life, who are lost and lonely, and who don't know what that day will bring. We pray for those whom we know who live with chronic illness. And we name someone who is particularly on our hearts at this moment. Compassionate God, surround them all with your loving arms and by your spirit, they, may they know peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves. We have just said these words, I am no longer my own, but yours. Help us to use the gifts that you have given us to build your kingdom here on earth. And we ask all our prayers in and through the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We sing together, Lord Jesus Christ, I have come to you.
We're going to share bread and wine together, and as it's the covenant service, and we've made a commitment together both individually and corporately, we wondered if uh, we could take communion slightly differently. Now, those of you who found change really difficult, you need to take a deep breath. This is just today. I'm not, I'm not changing everything, okay? I'm just suggesting for once we do it like this. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that we uh, stand or sit in a circle. So these middle seats here, if you need to sit, then please use them. Uh, and the rest of us, if you know you can stand for a few minutes while we're being served, you will form a circle all the way round. Uh, and we will share bread and wine in that way. Is that roughly clear? Great. So as we come to take bread and wine, we remember Jesus' last meal with his disciples when he took bread and broke it. He gave it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all. Do this in remembrance of me, for you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Loving God, we come to you. We commit our lives to you. And we thank you for the symbols of bread and wine, for what you have already done for us. So come now by your Holy Spirit, and may these simple elements and our response be a seal on our promises made today. May we offer ourselves truly in response to all that you have done. Amen. Amen. So if you'd like to come forward now and try and form a circle. Body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken. So we drink the blood of Christ shed for us in thanksgiving and sealed us in a new community. Amen. Amen. We'll take the offering now. Thank you. Loving God, we offer you these gifts of money, symbols uh, of our lives offered to you, our time, our talents, our money, and our gifts. Bless them, and may they grow your kingdom here in Wall's End and throughout the circuit. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is uh, Be Thou My Vision, that great hymn which is based on an 8th century prayer. I invite you to stand and sing.
send us out into the world to know God's love, to serve and to be served, and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.